I'm just going to go live right now. All right, welcome back. We are Comp 397 in the winter 2021 semester at Centennial. And it's week seven, part one of our broadcast. And let's talk about what we did last week. Last week, we focused on Unity's animation system, specifically with Mixamo. All right, so that's something we talked about last week. And we discussed how to make an animated character and how to apply the animated character's animations to um, our enemy AI. Uh, that was last week. This week, we're moving on to sounds. So we're going to create simple sound effects. And then after we create the simple sound effects, we're going to apply them to the game. So that's what's going to happen this week. I'm also going to fix up that last, if we can add some dust trails, we will. That'll be the thing that I want to do this week. So pretty straightforward. Also, what's due? Uh, this lab is due this Saturday at midnight. And then finally, assignment one, part three is due uh, this Sunday. I will be releasing assignment two, part one, uh, later on this week. Uh, most likely I'll talk about what that is. I want you guys to, what we're going to be doing starting next week is converting our game from WebGL which is what we're at right now. In the first half of semester, this is kind of the bottom of the first half, right? So the first half of semester, we're talking about um, making everything for WebGL. That's the that's the uh, you know your output. But then in the second half of semester, so that means starting off uh, in week eight, I'm going to release lab or assignment two. So now it's the new assignment altogether. Part one, and the assignments have been really broken out like this. Assignment one, part one, two, three, that's all for WebGL. Assignment two, part one, two, three, that's all for mobile. So starting next week when we get together, there's going to be this other additional lab that's going to be talking about, okay, how do I set up for mobile? What's the difference between mobile and WebGL? How do I set up for mobile touch? And all those kind of things we're going to be talking about starting next week. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. And then we're going to be converting the game that you have that you've made for assignment one, part one, two, three, into a mobile game in the second half of semester. Finally, as we move for all the parts, one of the things that's different about this second half of semester than the rest is that you're going to have a final presentation that's going to be due. It's going to take all week to do the final presentation. And what I mean by that is you'll be presenting live. You'll be showing off your game and all of its complexity and parts by the end of semester. So more or less what's going to happen is you're going to have uh, more of week, some part of week 12 and week 13 that you're going to be spending those last two weeks presenting. So it's going to be uh, that kind of thing. I'm going to be re recording everything. So you're going to have everything you can, you can see for you and for your, uh, your um, classmates. So again, uh, that was last week. Let's just get rid of this slide. We don't need that. So that's what we're doing. So starting next week, we're going to start with mobile. That's what that is. And we're here at the bottom of the semester, or the first half of the semester. Okay, so let's get moving on this. Let's move on to the next part. So I've, I've set up our Lab 7 starter, which is just Lab 6 final. That's what it is. So let's go there and start it off. It's going to take you to Lab 6A. I'm going to download this code just like you could if you've never done a lab before or somehow, or if you're just starting off, which is what I'm going to show you what to do. Then we're going to start from there, from scratch. And we're going to go from there in a second while this thing downloads. All right, so this is going to be, here we are. Here's lab, a new lab, lab six. And I'm going to bring this into our... Let's open our file explorer on the desktop. And I'm going to go to Centennial off screen here. There's Comp 397. And just like we've done in the last days, I'm just going to pull over this one over here. And I'm going to unzip it. So let's unzip this one to start off. Okay, there it is. I'm just going to delete this one so we don't need that anymore. And then rename this one to 7A. And then inside there, you can see the package like we have before. So that is our package and everything else. Now, what I want to do is put this up on GitHub immediately. So that way, before we start, we're ready to go with our uh, our project. So again, I'm going to use command prompt for this. 
I'm just going to bring up a command prompt and do a CD space and then drag and drop our project folder in there like so. Again, you've seen this a couple of times now and I'm going to say git init git add dot which means add everything git commit minus m And then that'll be initial commit and then git push. Oh yeah, well we can't do a git push until we have a place to push it. Let's make a new repository. That'd be okay. Let's make a new repository. So we're going to say that, um, did we move the right thing over? Pretty sure we did, but you know, we'll know in a second, won't we? All right. So comp. 397 in the uh, winter 2021 semester, and it's, uh, we'll say this is lesson 7a, which will create a empty repository. I'm gonna grab the last three lines of code, go up to our, go up to our command prompt and paste. And that should push everything up to GitHub. That should be everything we need. Now it's quite big compared to what we've done in the past because I've added a bunch of animations where we start last week. Okay, so again, if I refresh now, you'll see that we have assets, packages, project settings, and a bunch of stuff. We also have the wrong command, uh, uh, readme file. Let's change that up online. I'm just going to change this to instead of Simon is here, it's going to say demo project for week seven. Okay, and I'm going to commit changes. Maybe I should do it again because I messed this one up. Let's do one more time. I love when this happens. All right, so let's go back to this. Wonderful. And let's make another change. There we go. Sorry. Lesson 7A is what it should say. I'll be okay. Excellent. Now that we're ahead, we need to pull this back down. So I'm just going to go here and do a git pull. And that's going to pull it back so you see that we have the latest version of the readme file. Awesome. Let's add this into our Unity Hub. So just like before, we're going to go to Unity Hub. And I'm going to click on Add. And I'm going to go to our project where we found it on the desktop. And that's under Centennial and under Comp 397. And this one, select. And then I'm just going to kick it off. Again, all the things you've seen before, nothing new here. That's Adobe Audition. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. All right, awesome. So we're, we're pushing this together, and you should have um, everything up and going very shortly. By the way, welcome to those people up on YouTube. Thank you for joining me on YouTube as well as the people here locally on Zoom. So I've got both groups of people, that's a good thing. And what that does is it gives us a chance to watch any way you like, which is what I wanted you guys to have an option to do. All right, and when this, once this fills in, we'll, we will see where we left off from last day, and then we will go from there. So again, whenever you pull a project down from, uh, from GitHub, a couple of things that are gonna change. Notice that there is no scene that's proper. I'm going to go into scenes and double click on main. It's going to ask me to import my assets. I'm going to say yes and import text mesh pro. Otherwise I will not see my, my assets properly. Cool. And what I want to do is test out what I have just so that I see that we're on the right spot. So here we are. We can see that we're here and you know, now we have our our little man, he's trying to follow us here. And he's been caught up here. And let's see what's going to happen as they try and follow me. So that's where we were last time. What I want now is for me to do a couple things. These guys are running around trying to trying to get me based on their line of sight. There they are. And it'd be nice if we do a couple of additional things here. So we've got a much larger uh, tile set. Right, so we can kind of go where we must. There's a couple of them. 
I'm going to do a couple things. One, I'm going to turn off the marker again because I don't want to see the markers. Okay. I'm also going to get rid of one of the enemies. I don't see, I don't need both of them. I just need one. And we're just going to put this enemy here. We've got a very simple way of doing um, line of sight. There's, we talked about this a little bit. So we have a line of sight script for, uh, for this enemy. Um, but what we're going to do now is just pull this enemy down to the ground. There we go. And if you remember that when I click on the tiles and I look at the up here in the inspector, if I go to AI and if I look at navigation, then you can see that there are the navigations all pre-baked. Okay, so pretty cool. All the regular things we did last time. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to do a bit of an experiment, right? So what I want to do is when the player uh, moves around and especially jumps, so we're going to make a little jump sound. And how is that, is that going to work, right? So for now, what I'm going to do to facilitate this is I'm going to stop the, the enemy from working. I'm just going to turn them off. So we're just going to uncheck this little enemy right here. And when I press play, it'll give me the ability to play without an enemy. Okay, so there we go. And we can jump around. And I want to hear that jump sound happening, right? There we go. We can jump around. Yay. Awesome. All right, so that's what I want to do. I want to have my little jump sound happen. And whenever I get hit, I want a hit sound. And whenever, you know, uh, maybe my enemy gets hit, they're going to have a hit sound. We'll talk about how to do all those things. So let's get back to the PowerPoint right now. So again, there's going to be some assumptions here. One, you've never used audio for Unity. If you have, great. You're way ahead. That's fantastic. And I've waited to talk about this because you can download some simple sounds from the asset store or you can make your own. So there's a couple things to know about the, uh, the whenever you make sounds. There are sources of sound, and there's something called the listener, all right? So basic uh, theory goes like this. When you look at the, um, let's go back to Unity for a second. If you look, if you're back at Unity, notice that our player's camera, our player cam, but not our minimap, okay, not our minimap camera, just the player camera, has something called an audio listener. And this kind of simulates what it's like for you to hear sounds in the game. So wherever the player is, so too is the listener. We can make sounds appear so that it can create sounds wherever we want. We can do it spatially in the game in 3D, or we can make it so that it's part of the player, right? Which is what we're going to do here. All right, so that's kind of what it is. So we have some kind of source and some kind of listener. The listener, in this case, is near the camera. It doesn't have to be, but typically it is because that's where you're going to hear the sounds. Okay. Now we need a couple of audio sources. And the way it works with audio sources is they're going to create the sound for us. You can use different sound files, uh, WAV, MP3, AUG, and so on. And basically, when we import an audio clip, whether we make it ourselves, or whether we get it from the from the asset store, it's going to look like this. It's going to actually show the audio clip. All right. So what if I want to create simple sound effects uh, for my audio? Well, I'm just going to skip down here to um, audio tools, which is on page 15. One of the most popular audio tools that are out there that are free is from Audacity. So let's go to this little site here. I'm just going to grab this link. And I'm going to go up online to Audacity. Let's talk about what that looks like. Here it is. So it's a free tool you can download for it's cross-platform, Windows, Mac, or Linux. You can download it. It's a, it's a, it's a native tool that's local to your machine. And um, what you can do is you can create sounds with this thing. Okay? So it doesn't actually generate tones for you necessarily. Right? So what it does instead is... This sound, uh, this this uh, this program, and I'm going to bring it up right here. Let's bring up, up Audacity. It is a sound recording and a sound playback and a sound effects program. Okay, so I can record sounds. I can plug in an actual keyboard, you know, let's say for example, or some kind of guitar sound or drum or whatever, 
uh, or a mic, let's say, and I can make sounds from my mic by just recording. So that's what this little program does. And then you can modulate things. For example, let's say I want to record my voice. And I'm just for now, I'm just going to go to our, I'm going to share sound for you guys so you can hear it. All right? It could be pretty loud, so bear with me as I do that. So I'm going to say something like, let's record. Again, I'm, I'm going to grab this link here. And before we get to recording and, and playing around, I'm going to put this link inside of our lecture area. So I'm going to say, create link. And this is Audacity. It's already in the slides, but I'll make it easy for you guys if you want to check this out. And Audacity, again, is a very simple program, free to use, of course, which is kind of cool. So I like that a lot. Uh, any kind of free stuff is always good. And you get a lot out of Audacity, believe it or not. Let's go back down to week seven. And you should have that link now, Audacity, right? So how does it work? Okay, there's a couple things uh, the way it works is once we have Audacity up, you can record like, hello, my name is Tom, right? I can stop recording and then when I play it back, hello, my name is Tom, you can hear it again, right? So pretty simple. What you can do is, um, I mean, that's a really simple, uh, silly recording, but notice that uh, in here, what I can do is if I press the control key while I'm hovering my mouse over this part here, there's two sides of the track. There's the left side and the right side, so two tracks, right? So stereo sound. And if I hover over and I zoom in, you can see that literally I can get to all the tones, and these are the, the notes, as an example, inside of my sound. So I can get right in there. And you can also see the dead spaces. So these, these areas here where the sound drops off here, and here, there's a lot of dead space. If I want to delete something, I can just literally just highlight the area I want to delete and then press delete. And if I want to highlight this area here, I want to delete, then I just can press delete. And then what I get is a much smaller recording. So if I press play now, hello, my name is Tom. And if let's say I don't like right, I want to get rid of that and I want to just drop it right here again, not a problem. I can get rid of it and then I can play it again, right? So back to this, hello, my name is Tom. And I can add effects. This is the really cool part about this. You can go to where it says effects and I can do things like I can amplify the effect. I can distort the effect. I can do a bunch of different things here. Let's add in a couple of things. Let's add in a phaser effect. So phaser makes my, you, by the way, you can, a lot of times you can preview this effect. Sometimes you can't, right? So let's try applying a phaser like effect to the sound and let's see what happens now when we play. It kind of lowered it, didn't it? So, and I can always undo, right? So I can control Z to undo. You can also look at um, generating chirps and I can generate silences and I can add stuff in there and cut and paste. Let's keep going to effects here. Let's do amplify. So I can amplify and you can preview the amplification. Hello, my name is Tom. That's pretty loud, right? So it's amplified by 12 decibels, 12 dB. That's quite high. You can bring it right down to where you like. So you can amplify sounds as well. And then once you do, let's say, for example, I try it again. Hello, my name is Tom. Very boring sound, but you can see it, it actually did it. If I press OK, it'll apply the amplification. You can see that the sound waves actually change size and shape. So they've actually increased or scaled them up. That's what these things do, right? So that's pretty cool. And what if I wanted to add other effects? I can continue layering effects. I can change the pitch. So let's say, for example, I wanted my voice to be lower, right? Um, you can see that right now the pitch is normal. I can lower my voice. So you can see I'm going percentage change. Let's go back down to, like, let's say minus 20. And let's see how that looks. Hello. So you can make it sound like a much lower voice. In fact, you can go much lower than that and try it out. But the lower you go, the more distorted it sounds. Same thing on the other side. If you want to go up higher, you can do that as well, right? Oops. Let's... Hello, my name is Tom. So it sounds a totally different way. I can undo that change, of course, right? Hello. So you can see that that is regular. I can continue with that kind of distortion. I can add an echo. So again, an echo is like reverb, reverberation, right? So you can preview it. Hello, 
I'm not going to hit this tunnel. That's kind of like not really much, right? The echo didn't really take effect there so so cleanly and so nicely. Uh, and again, there's a difference between, re between echo and reverb, right? You can see that the room size, you can adjust reverberation by the room size. If my room size is larger, it'll sound like it's more echo. So you can preview that. Hello, my name is Tom. Like I'm inside of some kind of larger area or I can make it much smaller. So let's say, for example, I re reduce the size, Hello. right? My name is Tom. Sounds like I'm in a small room now, and so on. And you can change some of these settings to make it so that it sounds like you're in a different room. Okay, so that's the kind of effects that you can add. Um, you can add a fade in and fade out. That'll actually modify the, the track, so it'll kind of fade in. You can see how that fades in. My name is Tom. Right? And you can also do the same thing with fade out. Okay, so lots of stuff you can do here and lots of different effects. You can also add additional sounds and mix and match the sounds together. So this is great if you have a sound already that you want to modify or you have a sound generation device. This is not a sound generation device. This is a sound modification program. What about for sound generation devices that we want to make simple sounds? How do I get that? Well, there is a another link that I want to give you. It's on the PowerPoints. Let's go back to the PowerPoints. First of all, if you want a professional program, there is another uh, program out here called uh, Adobe Audition. Adobe Audition is a professional program. It is for cost. Um, if you're a subscriber to Adobe um, Creative Cloud, you can get it for free. Well, it's part of your subscription. Um, it gives you a lot more details and you can create a lot more effects and layering is very, very uh, detailed here. But again, for you guys, it might be overkill. I'm just mentioning it to you if you want a more of a professional mixer from Adobe. But how about creation tools? This is the one I recommend for free, which is from uh, SFB Games. It is called Chiptone. There used to be another one, but now it's been destroyed because of it used to be using Flash, and Flash is no, sort of, no longer supported um, on any web browser anymore. Okay, so that's non-Flash version. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this link. And let's go out to see what that sounds like here. So this is chip tone. So this is a sound generator. Okay, it's different than what we saw before. That was a sound modifier. All right, so I'm just going to grab this link and I'm going to copy it and go to uh, Centennial and I'm going to add in another link in here. So you have this as well. This is chip tone. And this is for sound generation, right? So that's different than what we had before. The other one was sound modification. All right, so that's what this is. This is a sound editor, the other one, right? Sound editor. We need them both, right? Because the sound editor, which is Audacity, and this would be a sound editor. Okay. Allows us to edit sounds we download from the internet, right? As an example, or that we generate ourselves. So if I, like I, I just did my voice, as an example, you can add voices to your game as well. If you want to have a character speak or whatever, you can do that. And you can use Audacity to modify those, uh, those voices. You can also add other effects as well. And you can download effects from the internet. <clears throat> Let's go to Chiptone though for a second and see what that looks like. So Chiptone allows you to create some basic sounds, like for example, coin, right? And if you... If you click it again, it'll do another one until you find the sound that you like. And then what you can do with that sound for the coin sound, and you can make your own, by the way. You have your whole piano here that you can use, right? And you can change the type of sound it's making. So, for example, I want to make more of a square sound, or I want to make it rounder. I can add vibrato. and harmony as well. And if I don't like that, I can go with more of a mm -hmm. sharp sound where I pick up a coin and it sounds interesting. So let's just do that again. And you can always save this sound as a wave file and allow you to save the sound out as a wave file or whatever you want. We can also do a boom, right? Or a jump. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Let's use that one as a jump sound and let's use some vibrato on there. Right? 
So every time I jump, I'm going to hear that sound. It's silly, but let's try and see how we can incorporate this into Unity, right? So again, that's what's going to happen every time I jump. You're going to hear that sound. All right, so how do we do it? Well, let's click on this Save Wave file. And we're going to, uh, it says, do you want to allow multiple files? Sure, we do. And it says Sound Wave. I'm going to call this the Jump Dot Wave. Right, and I want to put this inside of my desktop. I'm going to go to Centennial, Comp 397, Lesson 7A, and put it inside of Assets. But we we have an audio area there. There it is. And inside of Assets, I'm going to put the jump dot wave and click Save. There, awesome. Let's see what it looks like in Unity when I bring it in. So now, notice when I come back to Unity, I go to Audio. There it is. And in Unity, what I can do is I can bring it up and I should be able to try it out, right? That's what it's going to sound like in Unity as well. All right, FL Studio is also pretty cool, Chadwick. There's lots and lots of different sound effect uh, creation modification programs out there. I encourage you guys to try different things that make sense. All right, so again, very similar, very simple stuff is what I'm doing here. All right, so cool. So I've got a little jump sound, right, as an example, and I want to make it work every time I jump. Well, we know we have our player controls. So in our player controls, I have a player controller, my player behavior. Let's double click on that player behavior and bring up our code. And what I want to do here is I want to get a reference to the, uh, you know, to the uh, audio source, but I don't have an audio source yet. So first, let's just do some preparation. I'm going to go down here under header. And I'm going to say that these are, uh, you know, sounds, right? So player sounds, let's say. Player sounds. And we need some uh, player sounds. I'm going to have two audio sources. So I'm going to say it's a public audio source. One day when my uh, Visual Studio 2019 actually responds because it's trying to figure out what's happening when I'm using ReSharp or C++ for the first time. Now there's going to be two audio sources. The first audio source is going to be the jump sound. We'll call this the jump sound. Okay, and the second audio source is going to be the hit sound. Hit sound, being hit. Audio source. Hit sound. Okay, so I've got both jump sound and hit sound. I don't have these audio sources yet. Let's add them to our player. So again, I'm going to go back to here and under my player, I'm going to add a new uh, object. I'm going to do that inside of my um, prefab just because I know it's coming. So I'm going to go to resources, prefabs, and double click on my, or on my player. There's my player prefab. And what I want to do is a couple things, right? One thing is I noticed that there's something that's missing from my player prefab that exists in the scene. Let's go back to that scene. So notice in, in the scene, I have a capsule collider for the player that is a trigger that I'm using for um, line of sight. So I want to do overrides and I want to click apply all. I didn't do that last time. Now we can double click on the player prefab and now we'll have that capsule collider which I want to move up. I remember I can't do this moving up stuff or moving around the components when I'm in play mode, but I'm in I'm inside of uh, prefab mode, which is what you're seeing here, special mode that we can modify our prefabs, kind of in isolation. Okay, that's what they do. And notice I have a couple sounds here, but I don't have any audio sources. Let's add them. So I'll add a new audio source. Okay, so there's a new audio source. There it is. And we're going to move this audio source up. Okay, there's our audio source. And we'll make another one too. We don't have this one yet, but we'll, we'll add it. So we'll say down below, we'll go to add component audio source. So two audio sources. And again, there's some problems with what I'm doing. We'll talk about them in a second. So move up. Two audio sources. Notice that there's no name for the audio source or anything like that. But we have an audio clip uh, section here. And if I go to audio, and if I go to my jump, and if I drag and drop it into my audio clip, I now have a connection for my audio source number one. The audio clip is here. I don't want to play on awake. Play on awake means 
when my player starts in the scene, it's going to play this audio clip for the very first time. I don't want that. So let's uncheck that. And there's also this one I'm going to uncheck. We don't have a hit sound yet. Let's make one in chip tone. So I'm going to go back to our internet site here, chip tone. And I'm going to make a hurt sound. Let's see if, what this looks like. Okay, that's not great. It's not terrible, but it's not great. Let's try it again. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's just try that. Oh, that's a little bit deeper. I like that. And we can add in additional things. Like whenever we get hit, try some of these other things that you, uh, if you like. Um, and they're pretty good. Let's see what harmony sounds like. Okay, it's not bad. Now, how about, sounds kind of the same. That's kind of like a bubble, right? Instead of a single beat, you get a couple beats. Kind of like that. I think I might keep the tremolo. And then when we play it, it's like it's like a boom, boom. You know, you gotta kind of get hit. Um, but if you only want a single sound, then it's just like a boom, right? All right, so let's try this one. I think I've got my sound. It's not too difficult. Let's just say wave. And just like before, where it says inside my assets audio, I'm gonna make a new sound wave that I'm gonna call the hit sound. Again, you could call this player hit, if, especially if you're making many assets for this kind of thing as well. Here it is. Let's go back into Unity and hear that hit sound. Make sure that it's coming through the same way. So, right? Okay, simple sound. Sounds like noise, that's okay. And we wanna bring this hit sound into the, uh, Again, as an audio source, we're going to go to, we have two now. We have the jump sound, and now we're going to have the hit sound. Here's the hit sound. I'm just going to drag and drop this into the audio source as well. Make sure you drag and drop it nicely. Also, we don't want playing awake or looping right now. That's all we have. We have our sound. It's at 100% and so on, right? These are our sounds. That's great. And now, how do I make this work? How do I, uh, you know, connect this all? Well, what I want is encode now. So I'm gonna save this, go back out to the scene. So here's my scene. And I'm gonna look at, I have two sounds. I have an audio source here and an audio source here. And now what I want to do is find the first audio source, right? And the second audio source. Now, my friends, this is not a great way of organizing audio sources, right? Because I have to either drag and drop, right? So I can do something like this. From each, from right here, I can just go like one of these, right? Drag and drop my jump sound. That's the first one. I could do this. Drag and drop this in there. It's going to make that permanent connection. And that's okay. It's a prefab. And what I want to do is up here where it says overrides, I definitely want to apply all. Awesome. Great. Now what I want to do is if I double click on my player behavior, I've got my jump sound and my hit sound. In order for me to play them, I just need to go jump sound dot play. Okay, so example would be, if I'm jumping, I want to play that jump sound. So I can just say jump sounds dot play, and that will play my jump sound every single time I jump. Let's see if that works. So again, going back, and I've got my thing there, and then, right? This kind of sounds funny, but it works, right? And it gives the player feedback, doesn't it? It's a funny bunny sound. All right. But what happens when I get hit? Well, I want to have it so when the enemy hits me, it's going to make that hit sound. That's what I want it to be done, right? So first of all, let's bring the enemy back. Now it's going to be a little trickier. Bringing the enemy back into play. Here's Crypto, right? Our enemy. Let's make uh, Crypto, we'll call him the enemy. There we go. Awesome. like it. And what I want to do is with our enemy sound, I want the enemy, um, when it comes close to me, and again, if you notice the enemy behavior, let's go back to that. So we're going to go to enemy behavior. So way down here where it's Crypto behavior, that's the enemy behavior. And remember, I have an idle, a run, and a jump. Cool. I have those three things, okay? 
I don't have an attack animation. And what I need is an attack animation. So when it's close, it can attack me. I don't have such a thing, right? In my animations right now, what we have, let's take a look at what we have. So under animations, we have the following under crypto. I have a death. I have a hit, right? So I have a hit, being hit, jumping, running, and T-pose. But I do not have any kind of animation for hitting, like an attack. I need that. Let's add an attack to the animations. Remember, as a review of what we did last time, what we're able to do is select any of the animations here and try them out. For example, an idle or a jump, even if it's the other jump, this one, right? Or running. Okay, that's our regular animation that's happening right now. So we can check all of these animations out right here. Pretty cool. Let's go back up to Mixamo. Again, this is from last week. So as a review, so Mixamo. It may ask you to log in again. It may not. If it does, cool. Log in. You should be able to do this nice and easy, just like you did last time. Not now. And when you're in there, you'll see the last character chances are you worked with. Here's my guy, Crypto, that I was working with last time. And, and he's in, in uh, T-Pose, just like last time. Awesome. Now I want to get some kind of combat. If you click on combat, you can see that there is quite a bit of combat. And you can add some kind of punch or kick. Let's see if Crypto will be doing some kind of punching or kicking. Let's see what that looks like. Right? So here's a crypto punching. Right? He's going to repeat that over and over again. Right? So he's going to punch. It's pretty slow. Looks almost like funny. Right? How slow it is. We can speed it up, by the way, over here with overdrive. I can increase the speed. Bam. Right? So he's going to keep on striking, you know, until you stop. There's also some kind of mutant punch, which he's going to try and do one of these. And also other kinds of punches. Right? So... You know, where they're moving, a moving kind of punch or whatever. All right? So lots of things. We can also go and just look at attack. So let's, instead of punch, we can look at attack. There's other things we can try. For example, if I had some kind of melee weapon, I would have, a, let's say I have something in my hand, and I can try and attack this way. But this kind of works okay, right? Even if I don't have a melee weapon in my hand, I can still, you know, try and club you with a fist. So maybe there's something like that where it's just like a hammer fist like this that's coming down on the person's head. So there's, this is mutant swiping. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. So that's a weird attack. Not sure if I like that one for him because, you know, again, mutants kind of like got a wide stance and whatever. And you can see there's other ones here as well. You know what? There might be other ones that make sense. If we look at, here's a mutant punch, right? And there's many others, right? So again, what we want to find is something that makes sense, right? Where we want to, you know, so he's getting hit as an example. I can also look at uh, zombie. By the way, we also have combat on. If I turn this on and I say attack, no filter, sometimes we get a lot more. Like this is not a bad one where he kind of does bam, right? And he's going to hit you with both of his hands. But it's kind of weird because he acts like a zombie and he's not really a zombie. So that's not going to really work either. A swipe, this is more like a, uh, a swipe that he's there, right? And there's other ones. Kicking, right? Some kind of magic spell attack. Right? And so on. Okay, I'm not going to go into all these different ones. But there's a ton of them you can find. Again, these are all different ones. You may find one that's a little better, you know, than, uh, you know, that makes more sense for you. So it's a jump attack. And so on. All right, so we're going to pick, you know, one of these, right? Let's let's say he is going to do this little guy here. He's going to do a standing melee kick, like just bam, right? So very simple front kick. Every time he's there, he's going to kick you kind of in the head or something. 
and this is good. That's going to be his attack. Let's download this one. Again, it's FBX binary for Unity, which is important. FBX for Unity. Frames per second, we want to go 60 frames per second. I think that's probably right with skin. And then click download. And then what I want to call it is crypto and then at something like that, right? So we want to put it in the right spot. So I'm going to go to assets, animations, and under crypto, we're going to see a bunch of them already. So we have an idea of what it's going to be like. We're going to say crypto at standing melee kick. Sure, we can put that in there. I don't mind that. It's not bad. That's a very descriptive way of what he's doing. So we'll save that. There we go. We've got our standing melee kick. But now we've got to include it in our animations. Now, a couple of things we need to do here. One, just like we've done before, right, we definitely do not want loop time on for this one. Okay, so if I just practice the standard melee kick here, you can see that we can see what it's going to look like when he's attacking. Okay, so some kind of attack. Yay! Right? We also want to go to model, under model, and I definitely want to do read, write, enable, so I can modify anything I need to and click apply. Probably don't need to do that, but it's okay if you do that. It's not going to hurt. Next, I need to modify the animation controller. So remember the animation controller was this. All we have is idle, running, and jumping. So question for you, should he be able to attack from running? The answer is probably yes. How about from jumping? Maybe, right? But let's make it limited. So they can attack from a jumping. They can only do it when they're running, when they're landed. All right, so kind of from a running pose, they can attack. They can do that kick, right? And they're going to keep doing that kick until whatever. How do I get the animation in here again? Remember, I got to go into the standing melee kick. I want to go down to where the standing melee kick uh, cl animation clip is and drag that into the scene into the animator. There's my standing melee kick. Now I need some kind of transition from running to the standard melee kick and back to running again. All right, but maybe can I go from kicking to jumping? Uh, probably not. Right, so let's just make a transition from here to there and make a transition from here to here. And remember that our parameter is called anim state, which is in num a numeric parameter. And the way it works is this, zero is idle, one is running, two is jumping, maybe three is attacking, right? Again, what I want to do is go from running to standing melee kick, and I want to change it from my condition, anim state that is equal to three, okay? And the same thing on the way back, from a standing melee kick back to running, I want to say that it's going to go from three back down to one because one is where it's going to go back to, right? There it is. So I can go from standing melee kick back to running and so on. Remember that we did before from my transition perspective, we want to reduce the, we want to reduce or remove has exit time. Same thing goes for the other way. So we don't want them to have an exit time to wait for one thing is to be finished before they start another animation. Not for this kind of guy, right? And again, from running to standing, what I want to do is reduce the total time. So we're going to reduce it down to like 98%. We're going to move this thing all over here until it lights up, just like this, right? And that's pretty good. Same thing goes with from standing melee kick back to running. So again, we're going to reduce this all the way down to where it says 98%. And we're going to move this over until it is lit up, right? Right there, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good small transition from one thing to the other. Now we have a means of going from one state to the other state, and it looks like our running is the middle state. But this diagram basically shows us that we cannot move from here to here and then to there. Can't go from standing melee kick to jumping. It has to go back to running and then from there. All right? So that's how it works. Cool, cool. Now we have a mechanism for doing it. Let's code it. So again, I'm going to go back to my code now for in Unity. And let's go into my uh, player behavior. And actually, what I want to do is I want to go into my enemy behavior. So crypto behavior. There he is. Remember, I have idle, jump, and run. I have idle, jump, run, and kick. Kick will be three. Zero, one, two, three. 
cool. I have my kick animation. Okay, so cool. This is what I want to do. If I have line of sight and, right, my vector distance is less than 2.5. I already have it in here, but instead of doing an idle, let's not do an idle. Let's do a kick of some kind. So I can say I want him to do a kick, right, if he's within range. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. He's going to do a kick, and he's going to perform that kick when he's closer to me when he's looking. Let's see how, how ugly this looks. Does it make sense? So save. And let's try it out now in the scene. So he is running and he's closer. He sees me and okay, well, what, what the hell happened? Why is it doing that? Right? Well, it, it doesn't know what to do right? It's close and it's going back and forth and it's stopping, right? So what is it that I have to do? Why is he shivering like this? Remember there was, there was a problem like this last time where he shivered like this nonstop. What do I do to fix it? Well, remember what's happening. The animator has no way to get back. It goes from running to standing melee kick which is animation state equals to three. And then from standing melee kick back down to running, which it's not greater than one, it has to go equals to one. So this is the problem. Whenever you have greater than both effects, it'll just swing back and forth like this. All right, so we don't want that to happen. Let's try that again. And let's do a couple things. So we'll move over here. It's gonna have line of sight. And as he comes closer, let's see if he can just perform that kick. There we are. He's looking like he's performing that kick and looking away at the same time, right? So, boom, he's trying to kick me, but he's really far. He's really too close to kick me, isn't he? Right? He should be doing it like way back here, right? So, I want him to stop a lot closer than this, a lot further away, I mean. So, go to, going back to my enemy, what I want him to do is stop, let's say, at a distance. So, under my nav mesh agent, my stopping distance, let's make that three. So much farther away. And then when he's within three units of the character, then he's going to try doing that attack. Okay. So again, he's within three units. But it's pretty crazy, right? Look, he's running, running, running. And then he's going to try and do it. It's still too close, right, isn't it? Right? It's not bad, but it's it's a little bit too close, right? He's coming a little bit too close. Let's even try it more, make it better. So again, let's make a stopping distance four, right? So again, what we want to do is we want to make it so that, um, and the speed of 10 is because of he's accelerating. We can also make the acceleration lower. So he starts off small and works up. So instead of eight, we can go slower than that. And it's kind of funny because he has to find us. He has to see us before he attacks. You don't have to make it that way. All right. Like he ran into us again. Like what's what's up? Why is he doing that? And you can see that I'm far away and he's not finding me anymore. And I'm kind of stuck here in this little place. And it's really terrible. But when I'm close enough, right, when I'm close enough, he's there and then he's back to running. But how come he doesn't keep doing it? How come he doesn't keep attacking? Right? So he did his attack and then he stopped and then he looked away. All right. Well, let's take a look at our code. So he did what he want, what I told him to do. Remember, it's just going to work the way it's going to be. So first of all, we modified it so it's 2.5. And here in our code, we said stopping distance 4. We need to change this to 4. That's number one. Let's see how that looks and if it modifies our, our code. Also, we're hard coding it here and that's never a good idea. All right, so again, you know, we can see our nav mesh aider, uh, our agent here. And what we want to do is, here's line of sight. Maybe what I want to do is some kind of attack distance. So maybe we'll make a new header for our nav mesh agent. And we'll call this attack. And we'll say that there's an attack distance, right, of some kind of floating point number. So public float distance. All right, so the attack distance is what we're saying. 
And we want to take that distance and we want to put it in here. So this way we'll give it some options so that we don't have to always hard code it. That would be not good. I want to be able to modify it in, in on the editor. So going back to this, let's go back and let's modify this little stack of stuff that we have. All right, cool. So here's my enemy. Here's my nav mesh agent. And down here where it says attack distance, it should be the same as stopping distance or something like it. Let's see if that looks, how that looks and what how that works. So again, going back to him, that's a, much, that's a little better, but he stops, doesn't he? Right, and actually we see his foot now, right? Look at that, right? His foot is gonna be right there. So maybe we do it a little bit like this. So three or 3.5, let's try 3.5 and 3.5 for the attack distance. That might be better. And that's because he wants to keep his distance when he kicks you, right? And he's going to try and keep, keep, keep kicking you every time he comes at you, right? He's also running right from the beginning, which is kind of weird. All right. Now he's too close. Now he's too far, right? Now he's right there, and he's not doing anything. It's got to be a minimum of that distance away before he tries it out. Right? There we go. Okay, it's not bad. I mean, it's not terribly good. And he doesn't keep attacking. He won't do it over and over again. He's going to just continue to do whatever he's going to do unless you move back again. All right, cool. So that is how it works. But why is that? Well, because it says this. If he has, uh, he has line of sight and the vector distance is less than the distance, then you're going to do the anim state to his kick. But he's already at the kick, right? He's already doing his kick. He's going to change this. And then if he's in the off mesh link state, he's going to do this. Else, he's going to go back to run. And this isn't good, guys. This else is not the, what we want to do. That's why he starts running at the very beginning, right? We only want him to start running when he sees the player. So when he has line of sight, then he starts running, all right? So he has line of sight and the distance is less than whatever. Let's try that out. Let's make it so that it happens. So else if has line of sight, right? As an example, as soon as he has line of sight, then and only then where he's going to do the run, okay? So these are the cases else. It's going to go back to idle. All right, let's see how that works. Again, this is a bit of a, um, you know, of a stack. We can also make it so it's a some kind of its own switch case, which is like a state machine. Okay, cool. Here, so here is when he does this, right, as an example. So he's got line of sight. As soon as he has a line of sight, then he's going to run, right? But if he's close enough, he's going to do the kick, but it's only going to happen one time. Okay, only going to happen one time. Why is this only happening one time? Well, because he's never going back and there's no loop time. So it's not going to, it's not like he's going to keep on kicking, right? All right, so let's try this out. So now when we look at the guy, he's not running, he's idle. But as soon as we come in within his, within his reach, he starts running at us and boom, he's kicking us, right? And then he's kicking us again. And he's kind of really coming close. I think he's pretty too close, in my opinion. Right? He's trying to kick us. Right? So maybe, again, I would probably modify this to go back to four. I think four is, I'd rather see his foot, as an example, than, you know, see his knee coming up in, into mine. Right? So let's see how it goes. He's not running right now. Coming back in. And boom. Right? That's a pretty, good, that's a pretty, pretty clear hit. All right? Now, what I want to do with this guy is I want it so that if I stay in his distance, right, if I'm still there, right, as long as I'm in his distance, so again, if it's like less than or equal to the distance, right, from less than the distance, always, I want to keep doing that kick. Well, in order for me to do that, I need to add um, loop time, right? So I'm going to keep looping until something changes, all right? Well, that means he's going to keep doing that attack if that's what I want. So how do we change that? Well, we remember that in our animations under crypto, 
under our standing melee attack, under the standing melee attack clip, you can see that loop time is off. Notice that that's off. Okay. And what I want to do instead is I want to scroll down to where it says loop time inside of the animation tab. I'm going to go down the loop time and click onto it, right? And then click apply. Now it's going to do it all the time. It's going to keep on trying to kick me as long as I'm in range. Okay. It's kind of looking weird, right? But we can try some attack combinations later. For now though, we're going to go in there, and as soon as I come in range, he's going to try and kick me, and he's going to try keep kicking me until I stay in range. But if I move out of range, he's going to come over and try and kick me again. And he's going to try, and it looks kind of weird, right? And sometimes he'll stop, right? Even if I'm way over here, right? Because I'm in range, he'll try and kick me over and over again, even though if I'm slightly out of range. See, that's like too far now, right? But it might be good enough for us. Okay, cool. So what I want to do now is when he's in range and he performs a kick, he's performed his kick, he's going to automatically hit. All right? That's how we're going to make this happen. So how does he initiate the hit on the player? Remember, the player has a, a couple of things, right? We have a player marker. We also have a minimap. And the player also has this health block, right? So notice that the player, if I have this, you know, I have an example. I have some kind of health bar that appears here in the scene. And that is inside the canvas element. So here's the canvas element. Here's the health bar screen space, right? Here's the health bar screen space. And notice that I have a health bar screen space little, uh, which we'll call it, uh, script there. So if I double click on the script, right, what I want is. And again, notice that is it's system serializable. I want that when uh, the enemy kicks the player, right, then I'm going to initialize this take damage thing. Okay. These are my hotkeys. I'm going to get rid of them now because, uh, as an example, those are just for testing, right? Those are just for testing. Now we're going to make it so that the only way that he can take damage, the player, is if the enemy actually kicks him. Cool. Every time the enemy kicks him, he's going to do some kind of damage. How is this going to work? Well, the enemy needs to have a way of doing that damage. So if I go back to the enemy behavior, when I do the kick, if I'm close enough, if I was close enough, for now I'm assuming that the player is going to remain close enough, right? Then and only then will I do, will I do damage. So how do I do that? Well, remember that I can start thinking about what it's called. So if I start typing health bar screen space, that is the, the object, right? But this health, health bar screen space is actually been instantiated in the screen. This is, a, this is actually pointing at the class. I don't want the class. It's not a static thing that I'm doing, right? I need to have my health bar screen space for my character. So again, back up here where it says attack, I want to make a new public and I want to make it so that I can connect an object with my health bar screen space in there. So health bar screen space controller, right? And it's going to be the player health. Okay, player health. So I'm going to say player health dot take damage. Right? That's how it's going to be. Or you can also call it player health take damage. But anyways, let's see how that works. So what I need to do to make to get that connection, right? For now, I can do a couple things. I could I could drag and drop the uh canvas into the enemy, right? But remember, if um, my enemy is a prefab, then if I drag an, drag another one in there, it won't have a connection. So I could do it for the first time, but it's better that it finds the object the canvas that has of type screen space is only going to be one. All right, cool. So that means in here under player, under the start, we can say player health. Wow. 
Player Health, which is the health bar screen space controller, right, is going to be, I'm going to find object of type in the scene. That's what this find does. Health bar screen space controller. So I'm going to find it automatically for me. Instead of me finding it by hand, it's going to find it by itself. Cool. Then what I want to say is player health, when I'm in range, I want to do that damage. Player health dot, and I want to take damage, some kind of damage. Let's suppose I do 20 damage every single time I kick and 10 damage when I punch. Okay, let's see if that happens. So I'm here. Cool. Excellent. And let's see how that works. So I don't have a punching attack yet. Probably will. So move closer. And I go over here and bam. Wait, what? What? What did it do? Health bar screen space. What? It got the wrong thing. It's not damaging me. It's damaging this guy somehow. What happened? What did I do? Well, remember that this guy has a this the enemy itself the enemy has also a health bar world space health bar world space uses the health bar screen space uh the health bar screen space value right it has its own health bar world space and the health bar screen space is the same code right there's the same code right because the health bar screen space is inside the health bar world space controller, right? And it finds its own world space, but oh man, it found the wrong one. It's going to do it every time, right? And I don't want that to happen. So now we have a bit of a conundrum, right? I have the health bar screen space controller, right? That's for, for me. But the health bar screen space controller is inside the health bar world space controller. Right? That's what I have. Okay, time to make some modifications. So the health bar world space controller is the one that's going to have its code. So this is the health bar world space controller where I have my camera, my transform look at. That's what it does with late update. I want the health bar world space controller. That's the one I want for, for me to damage. And it has to be that's built into the enemy. Right? So whatever the enemy is, that's where I'm going to do the damage. Hmm. So I don't want that to be the case, right? I'd rather that the, that the health is being damaged on the player, and when the health of the player is being damaged, then the player is going to damage their health bar screen, uh, or world or screen space. That makes more sense. Okay, cool. So that means that the player themselves needs some kind of health property. So I've got... Movement, ground detection, mini map, player sounds, and some kind of abilities or properties. So we'll say, you know, kind of a, a header, we'll say player abilities, right? And we'll call this a public uh, integer. We'll make it an integer health. So the health ability. I also want the player health. I want to set the player's health to different numbers. And I want to set the player's health right now to 100. So by default, I'm going to make a little range where the player's health goes from 0 to 100. OK? And by default, the player's health is going to be 100. OK? That's where it starts. So now if I look at the player's health, going back to the player, then you can see that the player health has a hundred there, right? What I want is when the player's health gets damaged, it loses it, it kind of takes damage, right? Then the player is gonna do reduce the health bar. Okay? That's what's gonna happen. So what I want, instead of the take damage being on the health bar, I want it both. I want the take damage to be on here on the player. Let's make a public take damage avoid, take damage number, 
which you have some kind of integer damage that's gets that's going to be done and then what i want to do is my screen space my uh what i have is my health bar here's my player abilities let's go and again i'll make another header for the health bar health bar where i'm going to say a public screen space health bar uh, health bar screen space control we'll call this health bar okay that's what this is going to be and we'll drag and drop this one okay so what i mean by that is now if i go back to the player objects it's going to make these a little smaller so you guys can see more space here and then i'll show you the complete code to put it up on github so if i look here and if i look at the player now the player themselves has a bunch of little sections and one of them is this health bar what I can do is then go to the canvas and I go to my health bar screen space and pull it in ah that's pretty cool so a direct connection but that makes sense because the player is going to be in the scene right now the enemy doesn't have to find it anymore it just needs to know where the player is as long as I find the player I can do damage to the player and the player can do damage to the health bar nice and easy all right, so that is how it's done. When I do damage to the player, then the player takes damage. So we'll, we'll see that health, right, minus equals to damage. So the damage will be, will be lower. Then we'll also say that the health bar, right, so we'll say health bar dot take damage, whatever the damage is. We'll pass that damage along, which makes sense. So it'll show the damage and will also take the damage locally on the player's health. Nice, nice. All right, let's go back to my crypto behavior now. And instead of finding the player health, right, being a type health bar screen space controller, we don't need that. We just need reference to the player, which we already have. So I can get rid of this. But... Remember what I want is I just want, once I have the player, then I need to have a way of doing the damage. We don't know that the player is only a, right now the player is only a, uh, a game object. So when I do the damage in here, player health take damage, what I want instead is to do something that looks like this. Player health, player dot get component, and then what I want to do is that player's health is going to be the screen space health bar, right? And I want to use the take damage account from the, the, the player's component, which is the health bar screen space controller. Now, if you wanted to break this down so you don't do a search, because this actually searches the player, then what you could do instead is up here where it says attack, you could say, you want to get access to the player's health bar again. So if I go back to public, I'll show you how this works. And we'll say that the we care about the health bar. Let's put that back. Screen space health bar controller. We'll call this health, player's health bar. Player health bar. Or player health. And actually what we want instead of this is the player controller. That's what we want. Not the, because uh, there is a player behavior. That's what we want. The player behavior is what we want. So player behavior is what we want here. Player behavior is this. Now, there's only going to be one player. This makes sense for the for this to be found. So we can say that player behavior is equal to find object of type. If you, could, you want to do that one time, player behavior. So we find the object. So it's the same object. This is just the game object. This is the actual player behavior itself. We probably don't need both. And then what I can probably do is in here, I can just say player behavior dot take damage. And that will do the damage. Let's see if that works now better than it did before. All right. And maybe there's more issues. We'll find out in a second. And if we don't have issues, we'll put this up on GitHub. So uh, he's traveling over here. He gets sighted and oh, whoa, hey, ho, oh, and he's gonna keep taking damage every single time he gets kicked. 
and he's taking damage continuously every single time. And it's going like really low. So what happened? How come I'm it went from like a hundred all the way down to zero? Well remember what's happening is it's not doing damage for every time he does the kick. No no no. He's taking damage, right? Every frame. That's what's happening now. So that, that take damage stuff is not happening every time he's doing the animation. Oh, no, 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 no. Right? So how do I modify it now so that it takes damage, but it takes damage only every time he does the animation? Right? Well, there's a couple things. We could create a counter for this. Right? So we could say something like, well, we want to count. And every time, you know, he's doing the animation, you know, he does that. What's another way of doing it? Is there someone else, somewhere else, another way to generate this thing? Because, I mean, really the animation, the animator, right? Let's take a look at this for a second. What else do we have in the animator that can help us? We have animator dot. Okay, we have our body position, our rotation, our culling mode, our delta position, our fire events, has bound playables, is human, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we want to do a target position and a velocity and a bunch of other stuff. But is there anything in here, right? We have, we can get behaviors, get floats, and get integer. Okay, so we know that it's happening. So can I, I set integer here. I know that it's, that it's timing, but when do I know that the animation is complete, right? Because it's playing the animation, right? It's playing the animation. So how do I know? I get setters here, and I got start playback, start recording, I stop playback, and I got an update, right? Well, is there a way of knowing that the animation stopped or the animation's over? And only then. Now, there's a, so again, a couple ways we can time it. So you can say that I want to do the damage, but I want to do the damage in a coroutine, right? So it's going to do its kick, and it's going to do its damage, and we're going to wait X number of seconds. So what is a coroutine? A coroutine happens when we want something to happen, and we want to make a timer, and we want to wait X number of seconds, and it's going to be an interval of, of uh, re repeated uh, kind of a, a, re a repetition that's going to happen every single time. It's going to finish, and once it's finished, then it's going to do the damage, and it's going to keep doing the damage on every specific interval. I could also make a hand timer here where I can kind of on update, I can time dot delta time and when it finishes i can also count frames there's a bunch of ways to do the same things but a coroutine is just that much simpler and if you want to look and see what coroutines are let's take a look at unity coroutine all right so if you look at the coroutine what a coroutine is is almost like an asynchronous um you know concurrent little uh, behavior that happens. We're talking about concurrency, something that happens at the same time as everything else. And the way it works is this. The coroutine has to be of type I enumerator. Okay, That's the one of the requirements for the coroutine. We can call the coroutine, right, um, by uh, using the start coroutine method. Start coroutine and the name of the coroutine, whatever the coroutine is called. So it has to be returning I enumerator type. And then we can say yield return new wait four seconds and whatever the wait time is. Let's program that in. So I'm going to make a brand new coroutine down here in the player in the crypto behavior. So the only time it's going to do damage is when it's finished doing some kind of time. So after a certain time. So let's do that. So again, it's going to return. We're going to make it private. We're going to make it of type I enumerator. That's the type it needs to be from a return type. Then the name of the coroutine. So for a second, uh, we'll call this do kick damage. Okay, that's the name of the coroutine. And then what we want to do is, just like we say here, yield return new wait for seconds. So yield return, if I can spell yield properly, new, a new wait for seconds objects. Wait for seconds. And we can specify the seconds. Right now, that little kick looks like it's like 0 0.5 to 1 seconds in length. So we'll say 0 0.5 seconds. All right? 
And then we'll do the damage. So we'll wait this long and then do the damage. So we'll go back up here and grab this one from here. And we'll go down here and we'll do the damage. Now this is going to be a, a loop that's going to last forever. So when I call this here, it's every time we come down and if the distance is less than this, it's going to call that coroutine again. Now we got to be careful because we'd only want it to call it once. So we're going to say start coroutine and we're going to call that do kick damage. All right, so that's going to be the coroutine that's going to start every time we do the kick. Remember, the coroutine is just going to be on a timer. It's using concurrency, or if you think about it, like a parallel process. That's what's happening right here. Okay, but what we want is for stop coroutine. So stop coroutine, and it's going to be the do kick damage. So as soon as it does it once, it's going to stop until it's called again. All right? Wait four seconds, right? Let's see if this works and how it works. So is it only going to do it once? What happens if I take care of this? Let's see what happens. Let's see if this even work at all. All right, we're running this now, and we're going to go back and press play, and let's see what happens. So we're going to run over here, la, la, la. It's going to come close, and bam, bam. And we keep on taking damage forever, and it's not stopping. And even if I go away, it's okay. But as soon as I don't go away, it's like it's just doing crazy damage all the all every time. It's like it's like negative, like a big amount all the time. It's crazy. Look at that. It's like really spiraling a lot and didn't even pay attention to what I told it to do. So what happened? What happened? Well, it actually did what it what it was supposed to do, right? I stopped the core routine. Right, it waited for, for half a second. Let's wait longer. Let's say well, I'm going to wait one second. Does that make any sense? Let's see, how long do I have to wait? And by the way, what I want to do here is how long the whole, I'm, I'm, I'm timing it to see how long it takes. Let's see if this even works. Again, going back here, blah, blah, blah. I want you to think about the reason why it's, it's really going like quick. Maybe can someone tell me that's online here? So again, I'm back here and going over here and bam, everything is gone. And if I look at the player's health, it's like spiraling at negative 50,000 already and really, really fast. It's going as fast as possible. And he's going to keep kicking me as long as I can. Okay, how come it didn't stop? Well, let's take a look here. So going back to our code. What did we tell it to do? We said on update. On update. If this is true and I'm less than the distance, right? Then and only then am I going to do a kick. When I do the kick, it's going to go to this routine, right? As an, as an example, wait for a second. Let's wait for like five seconds before it does this thing. See what happens then. All right. Let's say five seconds, like something that's really long. And let's see if that works. And let's see what the difference is between like one second and five seconds. Does it even do anything? Okay. Bam. And took damage. Finally, let's try it again. And I want to see if the player, I want to take a look at the player's health down here. Okay. So let's keep an eye on that player health. So we're going to take damage and we didn't take anything three four and now we took a bunch and i'm talking like a great deal so we waited five seconds to do a crazy amount of damage all at once take 20. what's going on guys well let's follow it up let's Let's track it. So it goes here, waits for five seconds. So it did a bunch of these. Five seconds didn't do much. Before it did its first damage, it waited five seconds. The animation was still triggering. But this part here, it was waiting a long time before it was doing any kind of damage, right? Finally, it did damage, and then did it all once. Let's take a look at that behavior, player behavior take damage thing. Go to definition. Well, you can see that what, what take damage does takes the damage, 
It subtracts from the health. Then the health bar also takes damage. Let's go to the health bar. Go to definition. And then what it says is, okay, so this health bar, it's going to take damage, right? My current health is going to be reduced. If my current health is less than zero, then my health bar value is equal to zero, and my health current health is equal to zero. I need this check right here. I need this to go kind of inside of my player as well. Hmm, duplication. Duplication means there must be a better way. Well, let's go back and do this. So again, I'm going to go do damage. I'm going to check to see if my health is less than zero, then my current health is equal to zero. So it's not going to go lower now. Okay, but that doesn't solve the problem. Taking damage from the player still going to take damage as much as possible. So what could be the problem? Let's think what's happening here. The update happens as fast as possible, right? So every time this condition is met, right, then it comes in here and does the damage. Cool. Kicking, right? And what I wanted to do is every time this satisfies the, the, this thing, it's going to continue to kick, right? So it's calling this start coroutine over and over and over again. As long as this condition is met, it's going to create new coroutines, my friend. Unlimited number of coroutines that it's going to keep on triggering, right? Parallel to what's happening. Even though I stop one, the next one is triggering. And so this didn't do much of anything. Nice idea. But the way we've coded it up here, which is basically every single time this condition is met, then it's going to kick off the cool routine. Hmm, that's bad, right? So that is definitely not going to work. So let's do the kick damage. But instead of making it a cool routine, let's just make it a regular thing. And let's just not make it weight at all. Let's try the second way of doing it. Okay, so we're going to say it's going to do the kick damage. It's going to do the player kick. And we're going to call it right here for a second. And do kick damage is going to be the one that's going here. But let's do the timer instead. So we're going to say, well, if I'm already doing the damage, right, I'm in, if I'm in here again, let's wait. And I'm going to wait a bunch of frames. Now, one thing to note is that Unity has a bunch of time functions. So if I say time dot, you can see that we have fixed time. And we also have something called frame count. So you can say that, OK, well, the only time I'm going to do damage is if Time dot frame count, right? Let's say, for example, every because it can happen every sixty frames. Every sixty frames, so one once every second, as an example. If that is equal to zero, then and only then will I be able to do kick damage. Now, this is limitation to this too, by the way. Let's see if we can limit it this way. So do kick damage, and we want to do the kick damage once, which is going to do twenty. Points. Okay, let's see if that works. So every 60 frames, if this condition is true, and if the frame count is divided by 60, which means that the atom state is still going to be the same. It's going to be kind of, you know, looking at this over and over again. It's going to wait for a bunch of frames. 60 frames is one second of time, and this will work. Let's see if that works. Let's see how this works with, with what, what we, what we want to do. Does this work any better? Again, we're talking about delays, right? All right, cool. Go back in here. And the enemy sees this again and starts kicking. OK, that worked a little better, but now we went back to zero health. What about if I put my health like way up again? You know, as an example, it got knocked down pretty quickly, right? And if I move back here and I go up on the, on the uh, up here, as an example, here I am, and let's go over here, way over here, and I put my health back up to normal. So let's say my health back up and go to my screen space uh, health bar, and let's put that up to 100%. So we're back to normal again. So I actually did it by hand. And cool. And you can see the player again. Let's take a look at that health again and see what happens. So I did it, but... It just knocked it down from like 100 back down to zero in one blow. Still not as fast, but every 60 didn't seem to make a difference. It did slow it down a little bit. Let's say every 120. 
for the damage, right? Again, we're trial and erroring it here. And I want to talk about this because this is happening as fast as possible. Okay. Going back here and then back. But see, it went down, but it's going down consistently as long as I'm here, right? So it went down, but the timing is wrong. It went bang, 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 right? Well, this is the problem. And what's happening is that where I'm doing it is an issue. I'm using update. What about instead if I use something called fixed update? What's the difference between update and fixed update? Well, fixed update has, has a deterministic update method. Update tries to run as fast as possible. So let's try and run our agents with fixed update instead of update. Let's see what happens now. Okay, so our agent goes over, he's idle, he comes over and bam, and bam. Now it's too slow. But this is what we were hoping that we were going to get, right? So he's going to go down a little bit slower at a time. So now let's go back to that 60 seconds mark. Looks like fixed update is doing the trick because it's giving us a deterministic update every 60 frames. It might be even too slow here. Let's see if that's even 60 frames. Bam. Too slow. It's way too slow. It's like twice as fast, I would say. Let's move this down to 30 frames. Now you can see how that is. And I'm doing it here, and I could put a delay. That's what this is. So I could put like a damage delay counter, which I want to put up here. So with the distance, the attack, and some kind of damage delay. We'll say we'll call this a uh, a integer, which will be the damage damaged delay. And we'll set that. Uh, initial value to 30 and we'll take that damage delay number so we never want to hard code it and put it right here in the frame count okay cool let's see how that works so looks like fixed update fixed our problem to some degree and by the way co the coroutine would work here too bam okay too fast too fast too fast so now it's way too fast, but that's okay, because we have our in our enemy, right? So here's our enemy behavior. We can see that the damage delay is 30. Let's make it 45, and let's try it out here. So we can try it as opposed to me having to go into code again. I don't have to do that. Then we find the right amount. Bam, two, three, and then it, once it goes there, it's like it kind of combines all at once. And it's like, I don't want to start counting after the first one. So I want to kind of do the first one. And then I want to count and do the second one. Hmm. Again, this is where going back to what we said before might be the better way to do it. It works, but it's kind of janky because it really depends on the frame count now. So if our frame count didn't divide by 45 properly, it's not going to work. Okay, so that's where it's nice. Nice idea, guys. but. It's not right, and it should really work. As soon as I kick, I'll kick off a coroutine and do that thing. That's why I kept it sweat. So I wanted to show you the difference. Let's put this back as a coroutine now. So I enumerator. I enumerator is do kick damage. Okay, it needs a return type. Return yield. Return yield. Wow. Yield return. Yield. Woohoo. Yeah. Return new wait four seconds. And we'll wait for again something like 0 0.5 seconds. Maybe if I spell yield properly, we will do okay. I'm gonna spell yield properly. Maybe yield as in lower case yield. Okay, good. So then what I could also do is, as soon as I'm done there, I want to stop uh, stop coroutines. So stop coroutines. And I want to call this again, um, do kick. Okay, going back to what we had before now, instead of using the frame count, I won't do that. I'll just start coroutine. So I'll say start the coroutine. Right? It's going to wait half a second. 
and then it's going to start kicking. All right, let's see how that works and what's the problem now that we're doing it in fixed update. So this is a little different than what we did before. Fixed update updates a lot less. It's a deterministic update. All right, we're going to wait half a second and we're going to go back in there and modify things. So bam, it did it all. And but it, it, you can actually see it going down, which is actually an improvement of what we did before. But what's happening is as long as we're here, it's going to do kick damage. So what I'm saying, what I'm going to do it is this. I'm going to say that look, as long as I'm in range and if my coroutine is stopped, because it's going to keep starting the new coroutine, it's going to do it, start the coroutine, kick it, and then it's going to stop it on its own down here. This is going to stop the coroutine right? Let's wait a little longer. Let's wait for one second. And again, what we don't want to do is this. Instead, what we want to do is bring this into a float, a damage delay, right? And we'll start off with 1.0F. And we'll take this damage delay and put this down into the coroutine and see when it makes sense to do, how much it's going to do. So save, go back in there, and then press play. And let's see if that makes any sense. So again, running over here and ta -da, bam, bam, it doesn't do anything anymore ever. Okay, so that means that damage delay is 45. Oh yeah, 45, woohoo! Damage delay can't be 45, damage delay is gonna be one. All right, let's try that again. So we're at 45 seconds for it to do damage. I remembered the last the last value. Let's go back and bam, and it did all of them at once. And to show you this, here's my damage delay. And if I go back to my player and I increase the bump up the health again, you can see that it goes down pretty pretty uh, crazy all at once. Let's try it so that it's too long. Let's say the coroutine now for the enemy. Again, you see what I'm doing. Hopefully you get the you get the idea of what's happening here. Let's do two. This is back to what we did before. It means each coroutine is going to finish two seconds before it runs again. Bam. Bam. And then everything is gone. Okay. So what's what can we do different? Let's take a look at the code first of all. So online, it gives us some ideas about waiting for seconds and it gives us some examples of how coroutine is done, right? So it says wait for seconds, wait time, whatever the wait time is, and then it will do something, right? And it'll keep on printing this time out every single time it's been, it's been started. So it starts at once, right? Once it starts the coroutine, that's fine. But because we're doing it in an update loop where the condition is met every single time, it's going to do it and keep on making new these every single time. So what we need to do is, right, I want to stop the coroutine. I want to wait my damage delay, do my damage, stop the coroutine. And then what I'm going to say is, right, again, we can use both my damage delay. But I want to say, well, what if we're already in our, uh, you know, our distance? Maybe what we want to do is push the enemy back, push the, push the hero back. So we're going to get hit. We're going to experience some knockback. This will take care of some of this issue. How do I do that? Remember that the hero has um, a controller, right? So the hero or my, my player has a player controller, right? And I want to knock the player back by some amount. Okay, cool. So I have an idea of what I want to do. I want to knock the player back after we do the damage. So the damage is going to be done. And as soon as the damage is done, I want to knock the player out. That's why it won't meet the condition anymore. So it only does it once. I want to knock the player back by like two, if possible. If not, we're going to, and we're also going to make that sound happen too, right? Okay. So that's what's going to happen. I want to make, take the damage. As an example, as soon as it took damage and, it's, and it's, it's causing that damage to happen over and over again, I'm going to do the kick damage, which is going to stop this from happening, right? 
and we're going to be whatever the damage delay is. So there's my take damage 20. That's nice. But I also want to push the player back. So I want to say something like, well, you know, player behavior is the player, right? We know that that's the case. And we know it has a controller. And we know that the controller can move. So I can move some kind of motion, right, away from uh, this object, right? Notice that it, I can do a bunch of things to the player controller, right? Remember, we did this last time. I have move, but I also have a simple move, right, which returns the Boolean, and a move that does a collision flag, so some kind of movement. And just like we did before with the player behavior, I use the move, right, to move my object, some kind of maximum speed multiplied by time dot delta time, right? Here, what I want to do is some number. So it's going to be a vector 3, as an example, times time dot delta time, all right? And it's going to be in the opposite direction of the uh, of the enemy. So the enemy is going to do the damage. So we have to make sure that the enemy's damage or the, the vector is going to be in the enemy's best favor. So I want to do the enemy control, the controller, and I want to do a move, but I want to pass in a vector three forward multiplied by some amount, let's suppose. And we're going to say knock back distance. So remember, we want to go beyond distance. So I want to knock them back beyond this times distance. All right. Let's see if this works. So vector 3 forward, whatever the position is of my player, times vector 3 forward. And then let's see if that makes any sense. Or if that's not even enough. Okay, so blah, blah. And what happens with the player? Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe I got to add my current position plus vector 3 forward. We'll find that in a second. So, okay, we're here. And let's see. Let's enemy, hey, enemy, let's see if you can get me. Okay, so he's here and boom. And he, he didn't knock me back. I'm not feeling any kind of knockback at whatsoever. But I'm also stuck in the wall because he's got me pinned. Right? So actually, it works, right? Because I'm, he's got me pinned in the wall and he's knocking me back further and further. Let's try that again. And this time, we'll just go here and we'll go way over on the other side as opposed to close up. And we'll go this way. So we'll say that he's got me here. And there he is. He's going to find me. And we're going to run away. And I'm going to run over here now. And let's see what's going to happen. Okay. I didn't get knocked back. But I'm in a wall. And he, oh, he kicked me way off, off screen into oblivion. We, we even passed the death plane. All right? Okay. Just to keep it simple, let's do a couple of things here. All right? Because... We've got a lot of stuff going on. And again, I like whenever I do experiments like this, what we need to do is make an area that the player can, you know, kind of the enemy can chase the player, but it's going to be an open area. So let's make a new plane just to play with. All right. So that there's no obstructions. Right. So we can test the distance that the enemy gets kicked or kicked back the player. Right. So then we'll add the sounds afterwards. So we'll say we'll add a new. 3D object, we'll make it a plane. There it is. And we'll reset it. And we'll move it around. And we'll use our snap tools. So we'll use V snapping. So we'll go here and press V. And then snap it all the way here, like so. And let's make sure that it is pretty close. Looks like we're good on that side. Let's make it so that it's zero on the Y, minus 13 and minus 16. That's fine. And what I want to do is I want to take this, and we're just going to use this tool here to pull it across. So make sure the plane is something like that. Big. There we go. Really big. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my player well, I'll move in there, all right? But I need to bake a mesh there because otherwise the uh, the enemy won't know how to go in there. So we'll go make it so it's navigation static. 
and we'll go to bake and bake. So we'll make a navigation mesh and there's off mesh links so the enemy knows how to get there and we can travel on this plane. We also have to mark the plane uh, because this plane is really like a ground. So we're gonna mark this plane as a type of ground. We should mark it because if we don't then bad things will happen then the player won't know how to ground himself and move. So now the player can run onto the plane and he can, the enemy can see him, but now we can see what happens when the enemy sees the player. There's no blocks. Boom. And then it's a bit of a delay and the player got kicked to oblivion again. All right. One more time. And then tell me what's happening now, guys. Remember what's happening. So again, running over here and way over here, this guy starts running at me. He's going to find the shortest path. He gets to me and then he waits and then I'm over here and he keeps on kicking me and he's not close enough, but and and out into oblivion. So it did work, but it worked too well. Right, so that's what happened. So let's go back to the enemy and make some adjustments. Again, we're introducing a new thing, a new mechanic, but it's okay. So damage delay is two. Let's make damage delay one. Let's make the stopping distance four. And we're saying we're gonna knock back the player four units. That's what we wanna do in the direction of wherever this thing is kicking, right? All right. But it's going to keep adding, remember, what the core team does is it keeps on adding damage and adding distance for every core team. Every time I'm in there, it's going to keep adding distance to the player. So, a boom, kick me, and then, and then if it hits me again, it's going to kick me back into this little corner. And if I go over here and it kicks me again... Right? I, he keeps kicking me, but into oblivion. As soon as I, I leave, the, the amount has built up to an incredible amount because of all the additional core routines that have happened. Okay? So, fixes. Let's talk about fixes because we have the idea of what we want, but now the core routine is happening asynchronously and it's happening again and again every single time I kick. Well, let's talk about it. One, the kick should only happen one time. So we're going to do the damage, but the damage is only going to happen once. All right. So if I'm already in distance, it's not going to allow me to do the distance again. Let's add a Boolean. So public bool is attacking, right? I'm going to say that that's false by default. Okay. If I'm already attacking, don't do it again. So only if, and if, if not is attacking, right? Again, this is just going to be a Boolean. If it's not attacking, right, then I don't want to do a core routine anymore. I just want to do this kick damage stuff. Because coroutine is going to repeat over and over and over by itself, a separate process that it's going to do over and over again. All right? Let's go back. Let's get rid of these things. Okay. Back to normal. Okay, so this is going to do the coroutine. It's not going to do a coroutine. It's going to do the kick, but it's going to do it if it's not attacking. So if it's not attacking, it's going to do it. And then when it's here, it is attacking, right? If it's it's in distance. So it's going to basically say, I just did the damage. If I did the damage and I'm in distance, then I'm going to say something like is attacking is equal to true, which means it's not going to go here and do more damage anymore, right? In fact, we could probably put it up here. If da -da -da, is less than distance, is has line of sight, and is this and is not attacking, you know, as an example. So, and is not attacking, and not is attacking. If all those things are true, then 
go in here and attack. Okay, so you don't have to even put this check here. We can just say do damage, and then his attacking is true. And then we'll wait, and the only time it'll stop, it'll be go back, is if if the uh, if I'm not in line of sight, else when I'm back to idle or running, if I'm running or idle, one of those two things, then I'm going to definitely be is attacking is false. Let's make it so it's false. I'm not attacking anymore. And so now I can go and check again. Okay, but we also have to check. Let's make sure it's like we're just simplifying here. We're also going to check to see if I go to my enemy behavior, my crypto animation for my animation kick. I'm going to go back to my animations up here. And I don't want loop time anymore. It's going to do it once. Back to that. We have to, we have, all I'm doing is trimming so I can troubleshoot. What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Right? All right. Let's see how this works. So again, I'm going to go back. He's going to see me. Then they're going to come and he's going to do his damage once. And hey, that's pretty good. But he, what, I don't understand what happened. How did he kick me out over here? And he's kicking me. Look at that. He's kicking me back every time. And there's going to be a, a point where he's, where he's trying to hover between one state and the other. And that's what's the problem. Okay. It's good. But he's stuck. And I'm stuck. Because he keeps kicking me away, but I can't get out of there. Right? Because I'm stuck in there. But the really weird part is if you look and see what happens, I'm out here. And I get kicked in the wrong direction. So I'm over here, way, way over here. And my expectation is that when he comes and gets me, he's going to kick me like way over here. But I get knocked back in the other direction. Okay, so really what it's going to be is, and this is something else we have to think about, crypto, whenever they do damage uh, to the player, move my vector three four times distance, it's going to add to whatever the transform dot position is. Transform dot position plus my vector three four times uh you know times the distance, whatever the distance is. So whatever based on his position in the vector three forward. Where he's looking. And we're gonna play with this number in a second because basically let's go back here and go to here and go back down here. Let's see. Let's see now if this is going to work any different. Oh yeah, <laughs> it worked it or it didn't work differently. Okay, he's trying to kick me back, but there's no place for me to go because I am stuck, right? But if he kicks me here, then I'm going to go back here and and oh, he kicked me off the. Thing again, and let's see what happens when I go back here. Does he kick me further down? He does, so he kicks me in the direction he's going. But I think four is too long, I think it's way too long. Uh, for how long he's going to kick me back that multiplication that's happening times the distance, right? Some kind of distance multiplier, let's say times point, let's multiply that by 0.5, so half of that, whatever the distance is, half of that. Okay, still the damage isn't really working, but I'm trying to figure out the damage kickback now. So, uh, okay, so the plane here is running, running towards me, and okay, he really kicked me. And let's run over here and let's see if he's going to do it again now. If I'm over here and he's going to kick me to the curb, way too far. Way too far. So damage distance is going to be like 0.1. This is like units that I'm moving now. So it's just too much. But the idea is, is valid. The idea is like it's, it's it's kind of we've prototyped it nicely. All right. So all right. No, 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 no. I'll take a look at the health now. So he's going to move move back. He's going to hit once. It's off and he and he landed, but he only took 20 damage. That that's kind of how it works. 
we just got to really reduce the distance because it's zero, like something that's like really small. Some value multiplied by you know, a small number. Okay, again, so you can see all these trials we're making, right? Okay, and bump. Okay. Let's see how this works now. If he's going to find me, he's going to find the shortest path, and I'm in, I'm in here, and he took me down, but still too much. I'm just, I, again, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just seeing what he's going to do. So this is obviously faulty. Let's go back to this code. So instead of Okay, distance, we're not going to do that. We're going to say some kind of, of kick force or whatever you want to call it. Let's call it a kick force, public uh, float. We'll call it kick force, right? And we'll set it to some value, uh, which is going to be something really small, right? Like really, really small. Like, for example, 0 0.001. All right, something really small. And it's going to take that and multiply it by the kick force. So I'm going to start off with something really small, and then we'll work up from there. So it's some value, 5 times the kick force. So maybe that's too small. Let's make this instead of 0, 0, 001, let's make it go back to 0, 01. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, 0, 01 units multiplied by, his, uh, by the direction that he's kicking. Okay, going back to here, he's found us, and too far. Okay, let's go back to this. Sorry, just want to go to the enemy again. Let's try a different value. Let's try like uh, 0 0.001, and let's see what that looks like. Again, I'm going to keep on dropping the values until uh, we'll find the right number. Because it is a number there. Yeah, so we're going there. 0 0.001 is the kick force. Too much. Let's drop that to 0 0.0001 kick force. Crazy amount, right? It only kicked me once though, it like totally kicked me off. That looked okay this the second and third time around. It kind of looked okay. Let's make drop that even more. 0 0.00001. So I kind of built up a force for the first kick. Built up a force. Oh yeah. I mean, it literally took whatever my transform position was. So for that first kick, because of his speed, right? I think what it did, it added to our our numbers. So let's go over here. Yeah, we're kicked off. We come back. But then when he comes at us again, it's nowhere near that much, that bad. Still a lot, but not as much. He still has to build up quite a bit more. So it looks like, let's try a different uh, method. So we're looking at something called move. What about if I use simple move? Simple move is still a speed, right? That's what's going to happen. And it's whatever the position is, plus my vector 3 forward, as an example, so where he's looking, right? Multiplied by the kick force. Okay, so transform position, and this is kind of the direction that he's going. Right? Vector 3 forward is where he's looking, right? As an example. Let's just do one of these. Let's take away this position again because now it's a speed. So vector 3 forward multiplied by the kick force, right? All right, and the kick force is way too low now. It shouldn't make us go anywhere. Let's make that go back to 0 0.01. That's a simple move as opposed to a complex move which maybe is not what we wanted. Okay, let's try that out now and see what happens. It's running towards us and 
Okay, so way too, way too small. It's going to keep kicking because the that is is attacking and is not attacking as we move forward. So let's move this more. Move it to one. And try that again. Now I think we're back down to normal. It's funny looking to see it. The reason why he's jiggling like that is because he's like within and now he's not within. And he's trying to kick as often as he's as he's got because he's trying to redo that because he's in within range, right? So I think I think we got it, guys. I think it's like four. Let's try that now. It's keeping us at bay. But he's just colliding with us. And this is where I don't like the player controller. So the player controller, just letting you know, this, this thing right here, this capsule collider, sorry, this uh, character controller, this is the cause of it all, right? I mean, you know, sometimes people say you shouldn't use a character controller. And we've been using it for this whole time because of the, of the way it is, right? But what we really want is knockback. We want to be able to do damage and knock them back in a certain direction, right? The direction, you got to think about what the, how to do the direction. So the way you do the direction is where the player is minus, you know, kind of the uh, player's position. So we can probably do something like this. So if I want to find the direction, right, as an example, let's not do this. Let's do a, a kind of a subtraction. So if I want to find the direction, I can say the bar we'll say the direction, that's going to be equal to the player's position. So again, I can say player.transform.position, right, minus the current transform.position of, the, of the, um, the object. So that is the direction, right, and that's the entire distance, right? So that is the direction that I'm kicking, right? And then what I can put in is I can take the direction multiplied by the kick force. So what this does is it gives me a vector. Not normalized. This is just the entire vector multiplied by the kick force. So what I want is for this to be normalized, this vector, right? So I could say something like vector 3 dot normalize. And what this will do is it'll take this entire vector, it'll divide it by the magnitude and give me a number between 0 and 1 for each of the components. Then multiply by the kick force, whatever that is, that's gonna be the simple move that I'm gonna do in terms of speed. And we can kind of get the distance as opposed to, instead of the transform position, we'll have a better sense of how that works. So now, we can print that out too if you want. But now see how I'm moving away from him. So as he's going towards me, and as I move, he's moving, I'm moving in the direction that he's moving me, which is good, right? So let's go down here, and in the enemy, let's move this to something like 50. So well, that's my stopping distance. Duh. I meant my kick force should be 50. Let's see what that happens. So, um, 50 units of force, or 50 speed is 50. Let's see what happens. Better. I need more. Good, but he never completes his kick, does he? Because but when I'm pushed back, when he does the kick, right? 
it's like he's got to do my kick first, then I got to wait a little bit of time, and then I got to be pushed back. Right? So I got to see that whole animation, and I'm not letting that happen. Right? So he's okay. So I'll explain how, how this is working. So here's my critical behavior. So he's coming in. Am I attacking? No. Okay, cool. Then what I want to do is if I'm not attacking, then I want to do the kick damage. And then is, it ca is attacking is true. So I'm only going to do the kick damage once. The kick damage is going to take effect and it's going to do the damage, right? And what's going to happen is then he's going to do a simple move, right? So it's going to use some kind of kick force to move me back, right? But this is where I need to wait a bunch of seconds for it to happen. This kick force could be a coroutine that's only triggered once. Do kick damage. Kick back. Right? As an example, right? I trigger it, but I'm waiting for a whole second before I'm doing it. So let's do that. So let's say we'll call this a new coroutine, private. I enumerator. We call this like a uh, kickback. And we'll say that we are going to yield, right? Uh, new wait for seconds. And again, let's just wait for seconds one to see how that looks before we, uh, how about we return something instead of just do a thing. There we go. And now we'll do this simple move in the coroutine. And now here's something, the direction has to also be something we calculate once, which is this. And we're going to call the coroutine in a kick damage, which is uh, start coroutine, kick back. And we're going to stop coroutine in here. Stop coroutine, kick back. All right, so it's going to kick it, move his back, stop the coroutine, try it again, and keep doing it over and over again. As he gets closer, he'll start a new coroutine and so on. Where it gets finicky is if I'm in a corner, but that will be something else. All right, let's try that again. Again, we're getting closer and closer to the result we want. And at the same time, we're showing you how to use everything. Okay, let's go back. So now this is going to kick him back. But what we want is for the, we want him for it to wait. We want to wait until he does the, until the, 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 this part here, this normalization, this stuff. We don't want to have any of this happen, right, until he does the, uh, the kick. So I'm just going to put a large number in there. I want to see the kick happen before he kicks us back. All right, let's try this out again because the kick's not happening anymore because it's not triggering, right? It's right in our face. And you can see how it's kicking us back over and over again, but the, the coroutine never trigger. Okay, so again, let's see what's happening here so, so we can see what's going on. So we, when, we, when we go through the, the, the whole thing, so we're in fixed update, it's not attacking. Cool. If it's not attacking, then do kick damage. Is attacking is true. So we do the kick damage. He does it once, right? When I do kick damage, then it goes to here. Okay, so you want to take this is attacking is true, right? And put it in here, right? Wait, is attacking is true. When it's done, and after that, then do the kick damage. Let's see if that works. Again, it's the delay. We can also use delay and frames and all this kind of stuff, but you get the point. Probably trains are tricky. Oh. Okay, that's different. He's doing it, but he's not stopping quite close enough. He is kicking us a great deal.
Okay. Stopping distance has to be even more. Funny thing is, he's, he keeps on doing that, that kick as long as he's close to me, right? So he keeps pushing me, but he's only doing the kick once when he's close enough. So he keeps doing the push. So the kickback, this kickback stuff happens, but it only happens with thing. So, guys, we've talked about a lot of different things. What are your thoughts? Because I'm getting no input from you guys. I'm just doing, I'm just doing a lot of trial and error. Right? But remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it so it kicks back. And we only want to do it once. Once, once, once. Right? And remember also that we've taken off, again, we want to change one little thing at a time, right? So every time that, that he shows a melee kick, this melee kick, right now, all he's doing is he's if there's no loop time, so it's only going to happen once when, uh, you know, as long as he's in that state, right? So if I go back again, I'm just turning loop time on again to show you the difference. So again, going back here, and I'm going to this free space here just so we can see the difference. And he's going to try and kick, and he's going to kick again, and he's pushing me back, and he's trying to, to kick again, but... The, I mean, the direction is working great. It's just that he goes into this state where he's trying to kick, and then he's running at me. And when he stops, I don't kick. Right? So think about what's happening. He's waiting for three seconds, and he's going to kick, 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 and then that's when he's doing the thing. That's when he's doing the run. All right. So as soon as I'm far enough away, he's doing the kick one time and then everything else. Let's do one. Try it again. I know it's a lot of trials, but the thing is, you know what? This is how you learn. I mean, there's certain things that are happening and there's certain things that are not. It's like the kick, the delay is happening after the time. But not exactly what's what's supposed to happen. Where you were, it's going to be really hairy. Is what happens when you can hear? What happens when you can uh, hear the kick happening? Right. Remember, we have that other sound. So, what about if we add that sound in there as well? Remember that the sound is going to be generated by the player. Right. The player has the sound. The player has the kick sound, which is this hit. So. I want you to see how bad it is, and this gives, give me, gives, is going to give us feedback for troubleshooting as well, right? So if I go back into the player behavior this time around, player behavior just does the damage. That's all it does right now. It's kind of accessing the damage. It's it's lowering it once, and basically it's having every time it takes damage, I can do a hit. The hit is this audio source hit sound. So every time I do the take damage, let's make a hit sound too. Okay, so we'll say. Hit sound dot play. It's going to be really annoying, but but this is going to give you some idea of how often I'm getting damage. It'll it's going to say bang 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 like almost like right away. You're going to see that hit sound happen a bunch. Okay, going back. There he is. Now watch how many times he's going to get hit. That hit sound is going to come up. Right? Every time he's close. 
he's taking that damage, right? And a bunch all at the same time because that hit sound, that take damage is happening over and over again as long as I'm close. So let's take a look at that, right? That's a good indicator of what's happening, right? And that's why I want to show you that so you can actually hear it as well as see it, right? So it's going in here and it's doing the animation state, but it's going in here a bunch of times. Not is attacking. Remember, the only way it's going to be is, is here if it's not is attacking. And I put not as attacking here, and it's going to wait a whole second before that's happening. Okay, what about if I brought this back in there? So if I do the damage, like we said, then is attacking, right? Well, if I did it here, remember that, da, 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 that sound? Let's see what happens if I put it here. It's going to say it's true, and it's not true. That's the only time it's going to do this. So let's see what happens when I put it there. And so now you can hear the sound. Is it going to change? Should be the same? How's it going to sound? Because now we're getting visual and audio cues, right, for what the problem is. Right? Even though, right? Right? I know it's pretty loud, guys. I'm so sorry. But you see what's happening, right? It's going to keep on doing it over and over again, even though this is true. It's going to say, is attacking is true. Okay. When does is attacking is false? Oh, man. Else if I have line of sight and anytime I just have line of sight, my is attacking is false. All right, let's take the is attacking is false. Never going to be false. It's always going to be true. Once it hits me, it's going to hit me once. Because remember, these are cases that were happening too. Right? So you may have to be more specific as to how this works. Okay? Now it should only happen once. But we're also going to get him paused in front of us. Uh, and it's also going to do the animation just one time. Let's see how this works. So -da -da, he's running at us, and, and it's going to keep running at us. And if I go up farther away, right? Doesn't matter. He's never going to be able to do the damage again. He's going to keep running at us forever. Right? Because that's the way we've made him. And it did that 10 damage one time. So this is a hint of how to control it, right? We did it. And is, else, if I have line of sight, okay, then I'm going to run. I still have line of sight. And the distance is greater than whatever it is, right? So my vector 3 distance, blah, 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 blah. And by the way, Instead of calculating this vector three distance a bunch of times, this part, let's do it once. So we'll do it at the top of the of the fixed update. So we'll say var distance is equal to this, right? So that's the distance for the entire update. But now we have distance and distance. We'll say um, I call it attack distance or um, distance to. We'll say distance to player. How about that? Distance to player is this, right? So we'll say if has line of sight and distance player is less than the distance, and this will be the attack distance, uh, we'll say refactor rename, just so we'll make it exactly what it's going to be, attack distance, right? So if the distance to player is less than the attack distance and is currently not attacking, then do the kick damage and it's attacking is true. Okay, cool. If, else if, has line of sight and the distance to the player distance to the player is greater than uh, the attack distance let's just say equals not gonna we're not we don't care we could also add something so if that's true then well and we'll might we'll, maybe we'll do is we'll add a little bit of more we'll say attack distance plus one some extra buffer some bloat number then they're far enough away so we can say that uh, is attacking is equal to false okay now let's try and see what that looks like what is going on crypto behavior what 
of broke. Attack distance plus one. Anim state run. Attacking is attacking is false. That was weird. That is very strange. Player wasn't found? How is that possible? That's a glitch. And that was after that was after I put in the variable player of crypto behavior has gone missing. Why did it go missing? Why did it go missing? Okay, let's just do one of these. Learn else is idle. Just curious what, what happened there. That was weird. Uh, okay, has line of sight and distance to the player is greater than attack distance. And I'm always going to be doing the run state. Okay. Just taking this off. Hold on. Just want to check something. Gonna break something else somewhere else. Eventually, we'll put this up on GitHub, guys. You'll have everything you need. Yep, I broke something. That could be a Unity broke uh, thing, not me breaking things, because I didn't do anything here other than uh do this the distance to the player did i change something up here so player behavior is player behavior the player is a is this player object did i somehow mess with the player so the enemy and if the player is none, how is that possible? Yeah, it doesn't find the player anymore. That is weird. Okay, let's just do that. And now let's clear it. I, I'm just curious. I don't know why that what why that happened, but let's do go back to what I had here for a second. So hold on. All right, so that is if has line of sight and its attack distance is greater than one, then keep keep going. We'll say is attacking is false. At this point, let's add that plus one again. That is really strange, guys. Um, but anyways, let me just do that drag and drop. I shouldn't have to drag and drop, right? Because the player should have already been there. But anyways, let's just... I don't care. Okay, it's fine. Finds me and... Now... Doesn't do it at all. Okay, and it's is attacking is false. That's good. But he never gets close because of that extra one, because that's what's happening there. Good. Okay. And let's try it again. And now we'll do how it should be, which is this. That's the stopping distance. 
And if I say the stopping distance is less, let's say 3.9. So the last line of sight, distance this player is greater than saying that attack is false, and it's going to keep making it false. Hmm. After we added the distance variable, broke. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. I'm just curious why. Calculates the distance, distance to player. If my distance player is less than the attack distance and is not attacking, then do it. And let's just uh, let's just go back to has line of sight for a second. I'm just curious why this is doing this. So somehow when I refactored, somehow when I refactored, it killed something. Player dot transform that position. Player dot transform that position. That is weird. All right. Animator player behavior. Has line of sight player position. That is weird, guys. That is like tray weird. Let's try it again. Okay. okay remember when we have we have a couple of things here we have this player enemy and we have a health bar and is also this idea of has line of sight Right? Remember that has line of sight stuff? Where did it go? So line of sight is here. And we're saying that I have line of sight when other dot game object dot compare tag is equal to player. Player is equal to other dot transform dot game object. That's if and only if I have line of sight. And what has happened? But that's on trigger enter. That is weird, guys. That is very strange. It shouldn't, we shouldn't have to do this. We shouldn't have to put this in here at all, right? There is no player, right? There is no player because we don't have line of sight. And we don't have line of sight because it's going to say basically um, – has line of sight is false. So set it to false by default, right? Half sound line of sight is false. It's going to come to fixed update. It's going to say, okay, I want to get the distance to the player is whatever the distance is, but there is no player. And that's why it's breaking up here. So the only way we're going to get distance to the player is if we have line of sight. That's why it's causing a problem. That's why when we take it out here, it doesn't know the distance to the player because the player doesn't exist. Player doesn't exist yet, so I can't get the player transform position because there is no line of sight yet. I don't have line of sight because there's no player, right? Because line of sight is another thing, right? So distance to the player is a float. Let's make it up here. So we'll say distance to the player, public. doesn't matter. We can make it work first, remember? Uh, distance to the player. Distance to the player, two player, distance to player, I meant distance to player. Okay, that's it. So distance to player is here. And we'll say that as soon as I have some line of sight, then once I have line of sight, then I calculate the distance to the player every single frame. When I get the position, when I get the, the player, when I have line of sight, I get the player's position, then I'm okay. Then I can do that stuff. 
and then I can use the distance to the player here as line of sight is first. It should be because if I don't, then I don't care about any of this. Good. Then I can do the other stuff. I can say, and distance to the player is this. And distance to the player is greater than the attack distance. Greater than the attack distance. Should fix it. Let's see if that's true. And um, that's why I was getting those weird, weird reference errors because how could it know the distance of the player when it hadn't found the player in the first place because there's no line of sight? Now the player's been found. The distance to the player is one. Okay, let's take a look. That's why it's really good to see this. So now I can see the distance to the player is 2.7, right? And my stopping distance is four. Right? So my stopping distance is too far compared to the distance to the player. Look, distance to the player is 2.7, right? My stopping distance is 4, right? Attack distance has got to be 0. That changed. There you go. So the attack distance has got to be something like um, 4. And now I can get damage, right? And if I'm over here, it's going to find me. And it's going to keep on doing it one time. It's going to keep looping as long as I'm good. But it doesn't force the kick. doesn't really kick me back. Let's see, did, did it kick me back at all? It did, but not much. Okay, so now it's kind of working a little bit better. Distance to the player has to be, let's say, 3.9. That's right. Distance to the player, attack distance is 3.9. So slightly less than stopping distance. Stopping distance is there. Attack distance is 4. We'll make the same. We'll make this attack 100. And let's see what happens now. Eventually we'll get it. It's a great journey, though. Lots of amazing learnings. Okay. Didn't kick back too much. Let's try it again. Let's modify this thing right here and make it 500. It's a little bit off, but that's okay. I can deal with the off the, the offness of it. All right, so let's do, instead of 500, let's make the kick force uh, 600. It's getting better. 600, but we're in the right direction now. Everything's working, and not far enough. And it's far enough away that these values. Are Okay. It's getting closer. Getting closer. I've been getting closer for the last two hours, but we're getting closer. It only has a kick back once, but it does this over and over again. Okay, let's do more. I'm really asking me to kick back a lot. Remember, it's just force, not distance. I'm just moving myself back a little bit more out of range. 4.1. Okay, so it's got to be less. Instead of that, Instead of the 4.1, let's make it 3.9 and see what happens then.
And let's go with 3.8. How about just 4.0? Not 40, 4.0. But is attacking is still true because I'm not I haven't left the area. So if I leave the area, then I can do it again. Okay. It's a little bit too far now. So this is good. Let's go with um one thousand, well I'll say twelve hundred distance to the player it tells us the read how far we are away this is a good indicator of where we are right and that's going to be based on line of sights the initial line of sight is 24 units and it's running closer and now we're close now we're only 2.3 away when we got knocked back but if I run away again then the distance to the player validates my knockback again but now its stopping distance seems to be so close that I guess because of the acceleration, let's make that acceleration a lot less. So it can't accelerate that far, that fast. Three point eight. Three point eight. Okay, this is three point nine. That's good enough, right? Getting better? I think so. Slowly, slowly, we're uh, chipping away at this problem as we're working through it, right? I want to see, do I have loop time on? I do have loop time on. I just want to take the loop time off for a second and just do the same values. And I just want to see what, how it looks, if it looks better. It shouldn't be loop time on. It should only be loop time when I'm actually going to kick, which is going to be at a distance. So. slightly delayed okay so now that's the delay that's happening with this so one is too slow let's make it something like 0.6 and again i probably could use the delay damage delay up here those numbers like i, I had before as opposed to using a hard-coded value that might be better and let's see what the enemy has in here because so once we get one enemy good and we got the other ones so distance to the player Damage delay is one. Let's make it 0.6. Let's see what that looks like. Again, well now we have some values we can play with. We're getting much closer to where we want. Back away. He's looking in the wrong direction. Almost. I think it needs even to be faster than that. So instead of 0.6, it should be something like 0.5. Like what, what I estimated before. The knockback is still not sufficient. And anything less than 3.8, the attack distance. My distance to player is less than the attack distance, then, then I'm good. Let's see if I did it like way low. Three point eight is pretty close though. So this guy's gonna stop within four, right? So but he's also accelerating. And turn around. Three 
even more. So 0 0.5, damage delay 0 0.4, it might be 0 0.7. Let's try that again. No, it needs to be more than 0 0.4. I think 0 0.5 might be the best balance. 0 0.5, I'll say something like 3.8 was, was the right values. Not bad. Uh, I also like his, I think we need to, so 3.8, 0 0.5, 3.8, 0 0.5, 3.8, 0.5. And I think the, his angular speed, let's make that like crazy, like 300. So really fast, but his acceleration is low at four. Speed 10, so he runs up to a speed of 10. Get to me. All right, because that makes sense with his animation speed. Slightly delayed, so it's kicking first and then. It's a little bit lower, a little bit slower. So instead of 0 0.5, let's make it 0 0.55. Just that extra 50 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds. No, no, 50 milliseconds less. 50 milliseconds, just slight delay in his animation. Point three distance. Exploration stuff. You know, I think what I'm going to do with him because of, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty good. I think he's got like maybe you make his acceleration just bigger. Stop. Maybe even make it bigger than than uh, thing. Acceleration is ten. So that'll be his de deceleration as well. If I'm not wrong. So make his deceleration 10 and then run. I think we're, we're much better than we were, guys. We have an effect that we want. All right, so how about music? We talked about uh, this, this little sound effects that we wanted to make, right? Right. And now you see he's close. This is a weird spot. So where is he? Let's see what where his uh, distance is. He's at 3.87. So he's doing his run, but he's not really moving closer because his, yeah, like Not bad, right? This is still a glitch. There's still glitchiness. But again, you can see how we're getting closer and closer. But that's the idea behind it. You get slowly, 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 closer and closer until it does the hit, you know, more and more. All right. Again, so I think this is good. Um, one last thing before we go. How do I get, um, how do I get things like, uh, you know, a, a soundtrack in here, right? So again, um, if you want, any kind of sound, like any kind of music or whatever, uh, one of the best places to get um, assets is Open Game Art. OpenGameArt.org is a place where you can get everything from 3D assets, 2D assets, sounds, and a bunch of other stuff here. So if I wanted to say something like, if I go here and say something like, you know, soundtrack, 
right? And if I search through, and we can try and, um, and again, these are uh, kind of, um, you can try them out and see what it sounds like if you like it, right? Kind of an ambient sound. It's pretty loud though, right? So we don't want it to be that loud, but you can see that the soundtrack is here. There's a bunch of different ones here. Um, no. That looks sounds too. I think maybe we'll go with the uh, no this one. Okay, so we'll do that one. And what we want to do with these soundtracks is um, you'd have to uh, download the wave, right? So you can download the wave. Uh, when I go to assets, let's go to audio, and we'll just say soundtrack. But you'd obviously call it the soundtrack that makes sense for the scene. And we can see that the soundtrack is in audio. Here's the soundtrack. I want to play this soundtrack, but it doesn't make sense that the player should have the soundtrack. It should be something as part of the scene. So either some kind of game controller or something else that's in here uh, as an example. So let's make a new empty game object called game controller. So create an empty, call it game controller. And we'll add an audio source. And we'll put the soundtrack on there. And this time we'll make it play on a wake. Um, but we'll make the sound like 50% or maybe 40%, something like that. Cool. And let's see if we can just make it go. As soon as I play, here's my game controller. It'll play the soundtrack immediately upon playing. Now you can see it's playing in the background. Dead. And he's going to kill me now. There we go. He's kicking the wrong place, but he's at least he's, he's, he's trying his thing. Again, issues, right? But they're there. And let's just put another guy in there and see what happens when we put another uh, enemy now. Now, one thing we need to do with the enemy is we need to apply all the changes uh, to his uh, stats, right? So we'll duplicate the enemy now. And that extra enemy, what we'll do is we'll move it across to the other side so we can have two enemies going at the same time and see what happens. Running towards me. Here, let's try on the mini map. He's behind me. Let's see if I can avoid them both. You see that how the sound adds so much additional interest to the game, right? Just got hit once. Got hit again. And I cheated. Let's see if this guy's gonna come at me. Now, notice that it's happening immediately the same, right? So one of the things that, that, are, that are a challenge with this thing is that I mean, my, my health is down to nothing, right? But you can see what, what I did. So there, there's the, the entire thing. Um, what I'm looking for for you for Lab 7 is can you get sound synchronized with your enemy? 
I think that's the challenge here. That's the that's the exercise. I'm giving you some examples of how to do that. I'd like you to play around with the values uh, in order for you to produce something that makes sense. All right, so let's see what you can do. That's it for, for this one. I'm gonna save this and put, put up my solution. Save, file, save as, sorry, file, save project. And let's close this down and put this up on GitHub. All right, we'll say git uh, dot. We did a lot. We didn't do many commits here at all. Git commit minus m. We'll say added uh, impulse sounds and soundtrack. Okay, git push. And that kind of made the sound effect work. Plus, we also made our health bar work a little bit differently. Uh, next time, what we'll do is, well, again, we're going to move into mobile. When we move to mobile, we'll convert the game that we have. Uh, maybe with additional assets. Okay, now here's something that's happening. It says large files detected, right? Large files detected. You may want to try get large file storage. Uh, file size for soundtrack is 70 megabytes uh, because that's what I downloaded. It says uh, this is larger than GitHub's recommended maximum file size of 50. Do you want to use large file support, right? Well, why is that? Because one thing to note, uh, whenever you download WAV files, they're uncompressed, right? So a lot of times what we may want to do is think about, because this is 75 megabytes approximately, think about um, compressing this and converting it to MP3. And MP3 is smaller, but is more lossy, a little bit uh, smaller than this, okay? So for Lab 7, uh, the screenshots would be, um, again, I want to see the... the uh, uh, the amount of health go down for the player, but not the enemies. I think that's a good, if you can get a screenshot like that happening, um, I think that's important. The kick or some kind of other um, uh, animation type. By the way, for the kick, um, what I'll do to help you is instead of you having to download that and configuring it yourself, for those people who are watching it uh, remote, I will put the other animations. I put... Uh, I'll take the kick animation and I'll get all the sounds that I downloaded and I will uh, put them up on um, eCentennial for you so you can actually build the project on your own. So under uh, lecture, I'll add those things in. So let's add in the, um, uh, the new animation that I added in. And I want to make sure that that is correct. So let us, sorry, just one sec when I get everything here. Just want to give you, but yeah, but you get what I'm saying. All I'm looking for is, can you show me a couple screenshots? One of them would be, show me that the uh, the enemy's kicking, you know, as an example with the, or some kind of attack, if you chose another attack. Um, you can also include a animated GIF, if that makes more sense. Um, standing melee kick. This is the one. Standing melee kick. So this is this one. Standing melee kick. And I'm also going to give you my sounds that I made. Not that you, that they're an amazing sounds, but you know, why not? Um, just so that you don't have to get them yourself. You can actually download everything and create it from scratch. And I think that might be okay if you did that. Here's my soundtrack. There we go. And you can see it's a little bit bigger. I, I, again, I recommend MP3, and you can get an MP3 converter, uh, some converter program that will convert it to MP3. These things should be fairly small. Like my other sounds, uh, as a good example, my jump sound and my hit, hit sound, they're both like 20 ki kilobytes. But this is megabytes because it's an actual uh, MP3 and it's, it takes up a lot. Soundtracks are notorious for memory me memory hogging anyway. So you have to really be careful on how you use them. Um, as my soundtrack, let's put all the sounds together. Okay, and that should be good, my friends. I think you have all the different hit, soundtrack, the melee kick, 
the chip tone, audacity. Um, and the other thing I also talked about was uh, getting something from opengameart.org. Um, and again, opengameart.org has a ton of things. You can also use the asset store, of course, but uh, you know, these are the things that you can uh, definitely use to get additional um, assets. Okay, so that should give you quite a bit uh, to start your lab seven. And I think it's good practice for you anyway. Um, you can fool around. You might be more successful than me um, with some of that stuff. And I don't think it's there's anything wrong with it, um, with playing around like that also. I mean, you know, again, I'm just coding as I go. But uh, with a bit more of a plan, I think what you can get is a lot farther than what I've got. Right, and it'll give you a chance to um, to produce a character that's simple, that kicks back a little bit. There's different ways of doing what I did. Uh, I showed you a bunch of different ways of doing using timers. I used a coroutine today, um, which is something we covered, as well as other things. Right, so just before we go, just as a reminder of what's due. So, um, like we always do, is weeks. So this Saturday is when Lab Sevens due. Please remember that assignment one, part three is due this Sunday and I'll meet with everybody for questions on Friday afternoon between 1.30 and 4.30. I didn't get a lot of people coming out to last week's session. So I'm gonna wait for you guys to come on board about an hour again. And if I don't see anybody uh, between 1.30 and 2.30, then I'll jump off and I'll be on Discord for answering questions. Okay, otherwise that's it for me guys. Thank you so much for sticking around and being patient with all the troubleshooting and the trial and error. With that, a lot of times it's will be all right. Thank you so much, guys. Take care.